morning. I'd like to call the meeting of the Health and Human Services Committee to order. It's Thursday, March 14th, 2024, and we do have a quorum present. Um, I'd like to uh, say as we get started that we have a really full agenda today. Um, I would request that anyone testifying keep their testimony to two minutes or less. And please, um, if you have uh, testimony that is repeating what someone else has said, if you could confine it to um, aspects that are, are new to us so we get the full breadth of the conversation. Um, and and we do um, have constraints on how um, long we can go over today. So I really hope that we can keep to the, the time uh, limits on the testimony. So first on the agenda is Senate File 3134, Senator Marty. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is a bill for natural, natural organic reduction, which might be more notably named something like body composting. It's a way of of um, composting a body after death is far more environmentally sound than um, cremation, which uses a ton of energy and puts mercury and other things into the atmosphere as well. And um, we think it's something that should be allowed in Minnesota. Right now, the only way you can have a natural burial is if you, you can take a corpse and mm -hmm. wrap it in a plain cloth, decom decompostable, um, container and you can find certain cemeteries will take the bodies. Uh, with this, you would have the body composted in about a three month period of time and vessels, I'll show you pictures in a minute, but um, it would be very simple to do and um, a number of states have done it. It's people in effect have the body composted and then you take the compost remains and can use it for continuing the next cycle of life. Um, I have an A1 amendment I'd appreciate if somebody would author to put the bill in shape. Senator Mann moves the A1 amendment. Members, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? The A1 amendment is adopted. And with that, Madam Chair, I'd like to turn over to former Senator Carolyn Lane, who's going to speak briefly to the bill, and we have several other witnesses who will also be brief. Thank you. Uh, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Carolyn Lane, uh, former senator. Good to be back. Um, as John has said, he's given you some updates, so I will just jump down to the options we have today are some form of burial or some form of cremation, and some of them were opposed when they started, so it's natural to have people a little queasy about talking about the subject. But to me, it's a wonderful transition of earth to earth, quite literally. The body is laid in a vessel, and we have these pictures here on a bed of plant materials, such as straw, alfalfa, and wood chips, and some more of the plant material is laid on top of the body, and then air is pumped in and moisture is kept about 50%. The natural microbes in our bodies do the work of the natural composition that has returned our bodies to the earth for eons. The transformation that happens over a few months is total. The rich soil remaining has not a trace of DNA or anything at all of the human. The process is very respectful from the start to the finish, and families are deeply grateful. I have seen this in operation, and I love it. And we will hear a story of, from Steve, who, who loved it also. Uh, he is now deceased. <laughs> and then you'll hear more of the science and safety of it. This is already growing in popularity. Just three years ago, the first facility opened in Seattle. And now five facilities are in operation. Seven states have passed it. Arizona is working on it at the same time we are, and a dozen more states are in the works. MDH has asked for an implementation date of July 1st, 2025. So let's get this done now so they can begin their work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, I'd like to call on Taylor Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Welcome to the committee, and please state your name for the record and begin. Thank you. My name is Taylor Johnson, and um, I don't know, I sent a video to Anna, and I'll, I'll kind of cue that up if it happens. It does. If it doesn't, that's okay, too. Um, after receiving a diagnosis of terminal cancer, Steve Wheeler heard a panel on the radio talking about NOR and decided that was the disposition for him. He was quickly disappointed to realize that it was not a legal form of disposition in the state of Minnesota, so his second choice was green burial, and that was how he found us at Intera Green Burial by Mueller Memorial, where we provide sustainable disposition options. 
During a call with one of our funeral directors, Mandy, he said he, what he really wanted was to have uh, natural organic reduction, but he knew he couldn't do that. And Mandy was able to say, actually, we can. What he didn't know is that a few days before, I had attended the first ever body composting conference in Denver, Colorado, where I met Lynn Carpenter Boggs, who pioneered the science of human NOR and w at Washington State University and connected with the wonderful people at uh, Return Home, uh, an NOR provider in Washington State. I had asked the people at Return Home if they ever provided service to anyone outside of Washington, and they said they had provided NOR for people in 18 different states. But of course, that includes transportation from our state to theirs. And I came back excited that this safe and sustainable disposition option was something we could offer right now. So I returned to Minnesota and talked to our team of licensed funeral directors who were immediately on board because we were always enthusiastic at the opportunity to empower Minnesotans with choice, especially at the end of their lives. And Steve Wheeler, after we had that meeting, called us two days later. So we were able to say yes to him and give him his final wish. Uh, it may seem hard to believe, but Steve was actually excited for this plan of disposition, and uh, he was so thrilled because it would help make some meaning out of his own death, which is really powerful. And if somebody has the video of Steve, um, that would be the time to play it so you can hear we, it from him. And everybody. Yeah, thank you. We will um, see if we can do that right there. now. We're having trouble with the sound. There we go. I guess online there is the sound. Oh, they're hearing it online? <laughs> you can actually read it, though. Yeah. Well, I can read some of them right here just really quickly. Um, you can read it on there, but also um, what he's saying is um, that I can take this one action, this final action, and make some good. Leave the world a better place than I found it. Makes me feel better. It really, really does. Uh, and that helps. That helps in the process that I'm going through of dying, is knowing, you know what? In the end, this is going to be a better place because of my actions, my choice. What's the old saying? Leave the world a better place than you found it. And with this act, I can at least go out on a high note and say I have left the world just a little bit better than when I found it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next, I have Janet McGee and if Eric Halas, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing it, but if you could come up to the table as well. Madam Welcome Chair, to the thank committee. you for having me speak today. My name is Janet McGee. And while I work full time at the University of Minnesota's Mortuary Science Program, I'm not here testifying for them, but rather for myself today. I'm a licensed Minnesota mortician, a funeral educator, and a lifetime Minnesota mother who lost a child eight years ago in a tragic home accident. As a licensed mortician, I have performed embalmings and cremations. I have now had the opportunity to see the NOR process. The NOR process uh, is no more invasive than these other forms of disposition. It's arguably more gentle and accelerated. I see the need for legalizing NOR and regulating it, just as we do licensed funeral establishments, requiring a Minnesota licensed mortician to operate them. As a funeral educator, I see mortuary science students excited about this possibility of bringing NOR to Minnesota. I attended the Terracon conference in Tacoma last month and saw many aspiring funeral directors in attendance. Consumer needs are changing, and we are seeing a greater demand for eco-friendly and personalized burial options. So this next generation of funeral service professionals must be equipped to accommodate these consumer demands by offering all of these options to Minnesota families. When I lost my 22-month-old son, Ted, in 2016, I visited him at the funeral home every other day from the day he died until the day we buried him. If I had known about NOR then, I might have chosen that as his final disposition, but I could never imagine sending him a, to a different state for this process to happen. While having a background in funeral service may have made my situation unique, a mother wanting to be near her dead child's body is not a unique situation. 
She's trying to accept her new reality and she needs a body near her. The NOR process takes longer than burial and cremation, but would encourage families to be more active in their loved one's funeral. In our busy world, it would be another way to give Minnesotans space to start their grief journey at their own pace and in their own way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Hollis, please state your name for the record. And sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Eric Hallis, and I'm a Finnovation Fellow exploring the feasibility of bringing natural organic reduction to the state of Minnesota. I'm personally testifying in support of uh, SF3134. Um, while my interest was sparked by some of the stories that you've heard and stories like Steve Wheeler's and Janet's, um, my work has really been focusing on, on the process. How does uh, NOR work? Uh, can it be provided safely? And what might it look like to replicate uh, this process at scale here in Minnesota? Um, since legalized in Washington, natural organic reduction has been offered safely to over 900 individuals like Steve. Um, and uh, as uh, Carolyn mentioned, we've had the pleasure of being able to visit a couple of those facilities in person. And what I've learned um, through that process is that these facilities are safe, they are clean, they are welcoming places. As Janet mentioned, um, there are places that, uh, and what, there's one that actually invites folks to visit the vessel over the course of the natural organic reduction process. Um, referred to as some uh, as gentle cremation, uh, leverages hot or uh, aerobic um, uh, composting, the body's laid into a vessel alongside natural materials, uh, the proper uh, ratio of carbon and nitrogen, uh, and aeration promotes the natural microbial process, which raises the temperature over 131 degrees. Um, this temperature is important because uh, uh, it must be maintained for three days um, to align with the EPA's process for further reduction of pathogen standards uh, to effectively kill uh, and safely reduce harmful pathogens. Uh, this uh, is actually reached, a standard is achieved twi two times or more over the course of the natural organic reduction process. Um, the end product is not visually, chemically, or, microbiolo or uh, microbiologically recognized as human remains. Um, it can be used safely on trees, plants, or broader restoration efforts. Um, while the studies uh, on this is, are clear, or the study on this is clear, um, what I've been most excited about is how that study and research has been translated into practice in the state of Washington. Um, three providers have been operating at capacity without incident for years. Um, uh, they work hand in hand with the Department of Licensing, Board of Health, Funeral and Cemetery Boards, uh, and are rigorously tested by third party laboratories to ensure that the process and the end product is safe. Um, in, in addition to that, CANA, the trusted authority and educator in all aspects of cremation, is in the process of standardizing uh, training for this uh, process as well to build on that learning to date. Um, we have the benefit of building on all this research, and I think if the right folks are at the table, um, uh, we can do it safely here in Minnesota just as it's been done safely elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Now we have uh, someone on Zoom, Haley Morris. If you could please uh, state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Haley Morris and I am with Earth Funeral Group, a funeral home and provider of natural or organic reduction in Washington State. I want to offer my support of SF3134, which would legalize natural organic reduction as a gentle, respectful, environmentally friendly death care option. Natural organic reduction is a sophisticated process that applies cutting edge technology and engineering to accelerate the natural process of turning a body into soil. And this soil is rigorously tested and safe. People who, who want to choose natural organic reduction do so because it aligns with their personal values, as you've heard this morning. They want their last act on earth to leave a positive legacy for future generations, and this bill aims to honor that consumer choice. For Minnesota families seeking an environmentally conscious death care option, traditional options are just not as sustainable. Natural organic reduction reduces uh, CO2 emissions by nearly 90% relative to traditional options. And for example, cremation is a fossil fuel driven process with each cremation emitting around 535 uh, pounds of carbon dioxide. Natural organic production is already legal in seven other states, and this bill is modeled off of that precedent. In Washington, after just five years since natural organic production was legalized, we have not, as an industry, been able to meet consumer demand. The bottom line is that this choice may not be for everyone, but I believe that we can respect those who do wish to turn their bodies into soil by allowing a sustainable death care option to be available in Minnesota. Thank you so much for your consideration, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, and last, I have Judy Cook. Welcome Good morning, Madam Chair, morning. members of the committee. My name is Judy Cook with Cook Strong Selwood speaking on behalf of the Minnesota Funeral Directors Association, which is made up of more than 600 licensed funeral directors and over 250 licensed funeral establishments. 
We want to thank Senator Marty for his work on Senate File 3134. However, we do not believe that this bill is ready to move forward at this time. The Minnesota Funeral Directors Association supports providing natural organic reduction to the public. It is another option for families to provide a meaningful form of disposition for their loved ones. However, we need to further consider factors in the bill that will ensure protection of public health, protection of the individuals working in the facility, and ensure that the dignity of the decedent is protected. It is currently known that natural organic reduction does not kill certain classes of pathogens. We would like to see language added to the bill to address those concerns. Also, due to the direct handling of human remains in the process, we would like to further review the impacts in the bill which allow for unlicensed personnel to perform natural organic reduction. Not only does the bill allow for unlicensed personnel to perform tasks with direct interaction with a decedent, but there uh, is not a well-defined training program required for these individuals. Last year, legislation was passed that requires the Minnesota Department of Health to perform a study on natural organic reduction. The study is due in January of 2025. We believe that the results of the study should be considered prior to moving forward with legislation. The Minnesota Funeral Directors Association supports natural organic reduction. However, we would ask to have further dialogue with the proponents to reach consensus and address some of the concerns we have, we have raised. It is our hope that MFA, MFDA can provide input and be a part of the solution to bring natural organic reduction to Minnesota in the future. Thank you. Thank you, and that is, um, concludes our, the testimony section. Members, do you have questions or comments? Senator Abler. Well, thank you, and I appreciate the testimony and people's you know, desire for this. I, I don't know that the, the Catholic Conference didn't testify, I don't think, but there, there's a letter where they're concerned about uh, issues that I think are very important to consider and using the terms dignity and um, what are you going to do with the remains and, you know, I'm. There's a letter that I think people should read, and I think you need to acknowledge this, that there's another side um, that needs to be brought out. And uh, anyway, I just I wish they would have testified, but I, it's a meaningful letter. And I, I think in this world where there's less and less respect for life, um, and as we uh, talk about death with dignity and all that, that even at the very end of all that, that that's something to consider. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Senator Marty. Yeah, Madam Chair, Senator Abler, I, I appreciate that not everybody would choose this. Uh, in the letter, he talks about how we're used to eggshells and food scraps and so on. And I, I think when you look at the pictures of the facilities and how it's done, it's very respectful of the body. And I would argue it's far less intrusive on the body than, than embalming is. I mean, if you watch that process, it's really a intrusive thing, pumping out all the body fluids and pumping in all this other stuff. It's, it's anything but natural. Um, to me, this is, this is like the natural burial where it probably decomposes over years but has to be buried below the surface. Um, this way, it's, it's something you, in the end, have it tested that it's clean. It's just compost you can spread to do a garden. In other words, people, we've had people who have said they want to do this for their own, some place that was special to them. And this place would be allowed, you'd be allowed to dispose of the uh, compost on any of your own property or places where you have property to do it, because it doesn't have any of the risks of a dead, of a corpse. It's by that time has been broken down. So I understand not everybody would choose to do this. Not everybody would choose to have their body embalmed or cremated either. But I think this is a legitimate option, and I think it's very respectful of the body. Senator Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Marty, for bringing this bill forward. You know, we've talked a lot about um, bodily autonomy and individual liberties and freedom um, over the past couple of years here in Minnesota. This is a classic example of that. Um, this is about a person's wishes. Um, and it's about bodily autonomy. Um, and I see it, I'm very supportive of this effort. I'm grateful to the testifiers for sharing their perspective and their stories. Um, to me, this overlaps with uh, the End of Life Options Act as well, that people should be able to make these decisions for themselves. Thank you, Senator Marty. Thank you, any comment? Um, anyone else uh, have any questions or comments? 
Well, seeing none, um, Senator Marty, do you have any final comments? Um, and then, Madam Chair, um, I'm happy to discuss with anybody that wishes to talk further about it. I think this is a very important option for people. It's one I'd like to have myself. And I think a lot of us feel that this is an environmentally sound way to leave the world a better place. Our body is, my religious beliefs are such that it returns to dirt. and. Um, and that's what we're doing, and it's a very respectful way, and I urge your inclusion of this in the bill. So thank you. Thank you. And Senator Marty, this bill um, needs to go to the Judiciary Committee. And okay. so, um, <laughs> so yeah, well, should have, yeah. Ma'am Chair, that's fine. Should at the beginning, not the end. Um, so the motion, um, Senator Morrison moves that the that Senate File 3134, as amended, be recommended to pass and be referred to the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety. Members, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Madam Chair and members, the bill thank you for does. Your time. <laughs> Senate File 3134, as amended, does pass and is referred to the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we have Senator Bolden, um, Senate File 3451. Senator Bolden, I believe there is an A2 amendment. Did you want to adopt that as an author's amendment? Yes, Madam Chair. Uh, members, um, all those in favor of the um, A2 amendment, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The A2 is adopted. Senator Bolden. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, committee members. In this moment, when increasing access to mental health care is critical for our state, we need to take steps to streamline regulations, adapt to meet the current workforce environment, address service concern barriers, and support mental health staff to focus their efforts as much as possible on quality treatment. To that end, paired with separate efforts to fix Medicaid reimbursements, I'm bringing this bill before you today, centered on policy-focused improvements we can make to our mental, care, mental health system. This bill is focused on modernizing mental health services regulation to increase access to services and allow mental health service staff to focus on quality service delivery. This will lessen the barriers clients face in accessing care and allow providers to focus on care delivery to clients and communities. The bill before you represents many months of mental health care stakeholders collectively working together across the mental health legislative network and other partners to identify specific areas in statute where we can update regulation to advance the goal of increasing access and place the highest value on use of staff time. The language builds upon several years of work to decrease administrative burden and increase time available for client care. This proposal touches a number of mental health services relating to adults, children, outpatient, and residential levels of care. The bill language has been shared with DHS, and we will continue to work with them and welcome technical assistance to improve the impact of these proposals. I would ask for committee members' support of the bill aimed at practical policy changes intended to help address the ongoing crisis to greatly needed mental health services. Um, Madam Chair, I know uh, I'm happy to walk through the bill if that is useful um, for the committee, but also know we, that we are uh, tight on time, so uh, we'll skip that for now, but certainly can walk through it if members would like, um, and I do have some testifiers as well. Okay, so that sounds good. Why don't we go to the testifiers? Um, I have Shannon Brown, if you could please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Yeah, my name is Shannon Brown. Madam Chair, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of Senate File 3451. As I said, my name is Shannon and I'm the CEO at Fernbrook Family Center. Fernbrook provides a variety of mental health services across nine counties in southeastern Minnesota. My testimony is on behalf of the voices of many providers and communities across the state. Last year, I spoke with you about a policy bill proposing administrative simplification, important work that this bill adds to, and I can tell you the changes that were made last year have had significant positive impact. Our staff have reported they are now able to spend more time focusing on their on clients and less time meeting administrative requirements. But this work is not finished. 
I've been doing this for 13 years and I'm growing increasingly concerned about the burnout of our staff and our clients. Minnesota has talented, passionate, and intelligent providers and they are exhausted and struggling to even come close to meeting the needs of the clients we serve. The ongoing workforce crisis, chronic underinvestment, and a convoluted regulation system that creates and reinforces silos rather than bring services together is limiting our ability to provide services to the clients who are desperately in need. While we all know increased rates to create sustainability are necessary, the language in Senate File 3451 will allow community mental health providers to advance a more integrated holistic model of care. It further it furthers the efforts to streamline regulations and create efficiencies, which would allow the providers to spend more time serving clients and less time engaging in administrative tasks that are burdensome, confusing, and oftentimes redundant. Senate File 3451 contains proposals impacting multiple different mental health services for children and adults, from outpatient mental health to residential mental health. One example is removing the requirement for specific functional assessment and level of care tools. Clinicians are trained to identify which tools would be the most beneficial, and this change would support them in using this judgment, which would remove unnecessary and redundant paperwork that takes up time and can be a barrier for clients to access services. Another example is allowing CTSS services to be billed at the same time. This will allow us to provide psychoeducation to caregivers of clients in day treatment programs while the children are in day treatment receiving the service. This eliminates childcare barriers and allows us to provide much needed education and training to the caregivers so they can support their child's mental health needs in the home, which will contribute to higher success rates and reduce the rates of recidivism. By bringing the services together, we will be able to increase access, support our staff and programs by responding to persistent capacity constraints, support clinics compliance with regulations by creating consistency and clarity, and allow our programs to better operate in this post-COVID environment, accessing technology in the way other fields have. It will also allow our clinicians to work at the top of their license and focus on providing care to clients and communities. Madam Chair, I want to acknowledge this good work that you, the, legislator, the legislature, and the Department of Human Services have started in bringing our mental health regulations together in one statute, along with the first steps you've taken to streamline them. We're committed to continuing to work with you, the department, and our other community partners to build a better, more effective system for our community for the way mental health care should be delivered now and in the future. We know this bill is the next step in building a regulatory system with guardrails and the flexibility that allows us to respond to the changing needs of our service community. Thank you for your leadership and support. Thank you. And next I have Melissa Winkler. Winkler if you could state your name for the record and begin. Yes, thank you. Good morning. My name is Melissa Winkler, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of the HF3495 bill. I'm the Director of Quality Assurance for Northwood Children's Services, located in Duluth, Minnesota. Our mission and vision is to offer a continuum of service for children, youth, and families with mental health difficulties. We offer an array of services, including early childhood mental health daycare and treatment, elementary and middle school day treatment programs with therapy and skills groups, and specialized day treatment for children on site with higher needs that can't be addressed in their own home school. Our three residential programs include a 35-day residential diagnostic program, a qualified residential treatment program, and a psychiatric residential treatment facility for ages 6 to 18 to benefit at different levels of treatment with trauma-informed therapies, including individual and family group, skill building, educational groups, and a lot of recreational activities because the kids need to move and play. We serve over 275 students a day and strive to provide the best care possible for kids and families from all over the state of Minnesota. We propose the revisions to licensing standards because the current standards regulating DHS and the Department of Corrections, Children's Residential Facilities, Administrative Rule 2060 do not effectively meet the needs of the children served. And it is a challenge to comprehend for licensed providers, me being one of them. Providers that oversee residential care for children with diverse and complex needs can attest that operating under the authority of a set of standards that are antiquated and inconsistent does a disservice to the valuable care and treatment we are providing to the children and families on a daily basis. Services currently licensed under CRF Rule 2960 are extremely diverse and providers are too often impeded by the rule as it does not reflect the current best practices and services. This proposal 
provides a starting point to incorporate language from the rule into statute in anticipation of bringing future proposals that will continue this work. As has been reflected in other projects before this committee, to bring all relevant pieces of CRF Rule 2960 into statute and with your leadership, we can sustain oversight and adjust language as needed for these critical services. Provider experts came together to identify areas of the CRF Rule 2960 that are most cumbersome and unclear. Today's proposal reflects updates and supervision of treatment and services by mental health professionals and psychotropic medication administration. Both of these areas are imperative to be clear and consistent across services in order to provide the best care possible for our students. We believe the revisions advance the goal of articulating quality standards for children's residential care. We look forward to continuing to work with the Department of Human Services on this language and sustaining this important reform effort to achieve clarity as we provide critical services to children in Minnesota who require residential treatment services. Thank you for your leadership and support. Thank you very much. Um, those are the testifiers I have. Uh, members, do you have any questions or comments? Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I don't know if the, you know, you talked about the, the time, you know, the time, the intensity and the time, right? And driving someplace takes up time. Windshield time is not doable. And, and I see in the subdivision two, line 2.12, where it starts, you, know, you talk about continually uh, a face-to-face, -face, weekly supervisory meeting. But is there not an, an ability to have some flexibility in there that, especially if I'm a provider that my supervisor lives in Moorhead, for example, right, where the senator there likes the the Wizards or the Hartford Whalers, right? <laughs> and so if, 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 that, if that person lives in Moorhead and they got to drive to Sleepy Eye, right, and go through New Alm and see Herman the German to get to Sleepy Eye, right, that's a window time that that provider could be doing some care that we know is desperate in the state of Minnesota. So, um, Senator, is there, there's no ability to get some flexibility in that, or is that something that the department said is not doable, or is there any reason why we're not being flexible there? And again, I don't want to see like the Hartford Whalers leave the, you know. <laughs> Thank Sen you. Uh, Senator Bolden. Thank or? you, uh, Senator Hoppen, for the question. I'll, I'll defer to our, our experts here to speak to that. Um, there, was, there were provisions, and I, I, I won't remember the citation, but face-to-face -face does include telemedicine, so like video calls, so we can do those things via Zoom or Teams or things like that. It doesn't have to be face-to-face -face in, in person. So that's Senator Hoffman. Madam, thank you, Madam Chair. So the, um, that, that is some statutory reference. Bob, are you around? Maybe somebody can answer that question for me. Just shake your head. So it's, if it's already there, then we're good to go. If not, then I think this is not going to judiciary. It's coming to human services, correct? Um, it's not, according to my list here, it just we're going to lay it over. Oh, you are? Okay. I guess I'm wrong on that one. All right, so why don't somebody give me the answer to that? That would be nice. I hope that flexibility is in there. That So thank you. Thank you for bringing this bill. It's well needed. Thank you. Senator Bolden. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Hoffman. I will get you the exact statutory reference for that. I don't have it uh, with me right now, but we'll get it for you. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? No other questions. Um, Senator Bolden, any final thoughts? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you for the discussion. Uh, this really does build off of our work from last year to continue to uh, clarify, remove redundancies, uh, and make it uh, easier for these folks to do the work to provide the care that is desperately needed across the state while still having guardrails that keep patients safe. So I appreciate members' support. Thank you. Yes, it really requires a lot of detailed, thoughtful effort to do this. So I really appreciate all of the work that's gone into this, and, and we will continue to to um, see work going on. But I hope that, you know, if we can do things this year that, that help, um, the workforce is so desperately needed. So thank you very much. And thank you. Uh, with that, um, Senate file 3451 as amended is laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. And now Senator Bolden has um, Senate file 3552. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. This is another bill uh, around supporting mental health services. So our state is fortunate to have a number of mental health services uh, in place for Minnesotans in need of mental health supports. One of those services is a program called Assistive Community Treatment, or ACT. ACT is a service model provided by community-based mobile mental health treatment teams according to a national evidence-based practice certification. The ACT team approach is designed to support clients to live independently in the community. Sometimes thought of as a hospital without walls, ACT teams typically include a psychiatrist, mental health professionals, one or more nurses, substance abuse specialists, supported employment specialists, certified peer specialists, and other mental health professionals, practitioners, or rehabilitation workers. ACT teams help people treat and manage their mental, illness, mental health illnesses and develop the skills they need for life in the community of their choice. Team members work with individuals in their homes, work setting, or places in the community where additional support might be needed. ACT services are an extremely effective model of care and are a valuable component of our state's mental health services continuum. ACT providers across the state worked together these past years on regulatory changes which would allow them to increase access and efficiencies in delivering this service to clients. These changes are all aimed at better supporting mental health care staff to focus more on quality service delivery and less on regulatory and administrative hurdles. So the bill before you today contains those changes and seeks to clarify areas where there has been confusion about eligibility, remove the requirement for an ACT provider to have a county contract, and allow for limited flexibility in a key staffing position as well as replace redundant statutory language with reference instead to national accreditation standards. And lastly, align the diagnostic assessment renewal schedule for ACT to be consistent with renewal schedules for other mental health services in 245I. The proponents of this bill have been in communication with DHS about the bill and will cont continue to work with DHS as their technical assistance becomes available. Um, I want to thank our bipartisan co-authors who have joined me on this bill. And I would ask for committee members to support the bill really aimed at uh, practical policy changes intended to ease access to, into this important mental health service. Uh, and with that, Madam Chair, we have some testifiers for this as well. Thank you. Um, the testifier I have listed is Ashley Chose, and she's on Zoom. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much. Welcome, and please Hi. state your name for the record. Yes, I am Ashley Chose. I am the CEO of Woodland Centers. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to testify today in support of Senate File 3552. Um, Woodland Centers is a private nonprofit, CCBHC, and we provide a wide array, a wide array of behavioral health services. Uh, Woodland Centers has two ACT teams, and we serve eight rural counties in West Central Minnesota. In 2023, our ACT team served 71 clients and provided over 7,800 direct care services. Uh, the current workforce and mental health crisis is creating significant challenges for ACT providers to keep access available to these services in our communities. SAMHSA has reported that ACT teams across the nation have an average of 14% turnover in a six-month period. And Minnesota is facing these same challenges, which is leading to limits on the access for ACT services in our state. SAMHSA has also provided various descriptions of ACT implementations in rural areas that differ from fidelity due to staffing shortages, and really encourages ACT teams to enact these flexibilities across the nation. Minnesota's ACT statute at this time does not allow these needed flexibilities as recommended by SAMHSA. However, the changes proposed in this legislation would allow the flexibility needed for ACT teams to be responsive to the needs of the clients being served and to the communities being served. This legislation would help us sustain ACT programs across our state and ensure ongoing access to this critical service. We're very hopeful that this bill is the next step in the good work that we can all do together to build a mental health regulatory system that can flex and respond to the changing needs of our industry and to our communities. Thank you so much for your support of this bill. Thank you very much. Um, that's the only testifier I show. Um, members, do you have questions about this bill? Senator Abler. Just a short comment. I mean, it's getting rid of some of the redundant uh, efforts are really important. We, in the other committee, we heard people that are just getting crushed by excess work and not enough providers and the paperwork and all that. So I wish you well in uh, getting that squared away and 
There's other things we can do to minimize pointless reporting. You know, we, we need some reporting, we need accountability, but just the right amount. Thank you, Senator Bolton. Any other questions or comments? Well, Senator Bolden, any final thoughts about this bill? Uh, well, thank you, committee members. I think uh, I thank you, Senator Abler, for your comments. I think that's exactly it. Just looking to find that balance of what is, uh, you know, the right space of paperwork regulation and requirements. Certainly, that some of that is necessary, um, but not too much. Uh, so it's a, an unnecessary burden on providers, um, you know, who are we want them to be uh, spending as much time as possible actually providing the care, and, and in this case, a, a really valuable and effective service for people. Thank you. Yes, it seems like um, we know that there are many people who aren't able to access services, and so whatever we can do to help um, make the, the work um, easier, better, more streamlined so that more people can get access, it seems like a very beneficial thing. Thank you for working on this. And um, with that, Senate file 3552 will be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. Thank you. Thank you. And I am going to move to the table, um, and if Senator Mann can take over as chair. Madam Chair, when you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair. The first uh, bill that I am presenting is on an informational basis only. Um, we have submitted this bill for jacketing, and we have just somehow have not been able to extract it out of the system yet. So um, we will talk about it informationally today. I think it's a really important topic along with the bills that um, Senator Bolden presented to make um, policy changes within the mental health system. Um, I think that we need to also address the fact that um, we, we have uh, a rates problem. Um, we have a severe issue with uh, um, rates, mental health rates in Minnesota, and this bill would take steps to address that. So today I'm, I'm pleased to bring forward um, this bill that increases medical assistant, assistance reimbursement rates for behavioral health services. Nearly one in four Minnesotans have insurance through medical assistance or Minnesota care, yet public program reimbursement rates for behavioral health services are lagging more than 40% behind costs, most notably in the last several, several years. Minnesotans continue to experience a crisis in accessing mental health and substance use disorder treatment. At the root of this crisis is the lack of sustainable medical assistance funding for our mental health and SUD providers. Costs of delivering care and sustaining staff salaries, benefits, facilities infrastructure, and meeting state regulations have increased exponentially. But medical assistance reimbursements, the primary source of funding for our behavioral health system, are not keeping pace. For example, over the past five years, salaries have increased 32% for licensed psychologists, 62% um, for psychiatrists, 25% for mental health professionals like social workers, and 51% for other practitioners. And yet, reimbursement rates haven't changed. Out of necessity, community providers across Minnesota are closing programs or significantly decreasing the size of their services so they can maintain some base level of access to services for children and families. These service changes mean increasingly long wait times for appointments and delayed care. Some of these waits result in crises that leave children and families boarding in hospital emergency departments. The good news is we know what the path forward looks like. DHS uh, performed a rate study, and this is complete and was delivered um, a couple months ago, and several proposals in this legislation align with those recommendations. That includes um, increasing the substance use disorder residential rates, streamlining and increasing the behavioral health home rate, aligning RBRVS rates to Medicare rates, and increasing HCPS, 
HCPCS rates to reflect market-based costs. This proposal also includes additional proposals necessary to fix our rate system. These include increasing rates for inpatient mental health services, offering a 10% bonus payment for services provided in health professional shortage areas, medically underserved areas, and medically underserved, um, excuse me, and medical, medically underserved populations. Um, it also would eliminate the current 20% rate cut for services that are provided by a master level educated provider. Um, I'm pleased that the, this legislation was developed with and is supported by the Mental Health Legislative Network. We also continue to work closely with DHS on technical assistance and are awaiting a fiscal note. Given the current budget constraints, all the stakeholders know this bill cannot be implemented all at once, but we can start building a solution this year that sets us on the right path to solving a problem we have been trying to solve for far too long. Children, families, and providers across Minnesota are counting on us to chart a path forward, and I believe we can do that this session. Um, I'd like to turn it over to my testifiers. Thank you, Senator. Jessica Brisboy and Margaret Vermont, if you come down to the table. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you, Chair Mann and committee members. My name is Jessica Brisboys, and I am the manager of Acute Mental Health Services at Children's Minnesota. I appreciate you having me here today to discuss the solutions needed to address the mental health needs of Minnesota kids. There is a lack of mental health services in our state, and children are waiting for months to access care, too often utilizing the emergency department as a last resort. In 2018, about 1,700 visits to Children's Minnesota emergency departments were, were for a mental health concern. In 2023, that number had climbed to 3,300, and last year, over 250 kids collectively spent more than 1,600 days stuck at Children's Minnesota because the appropriate treatment setting was not available to them. The parents and guardians of these children have often recognized their child's need for support and worked diligently to try and get them care, but have run into barriers accessing outpatient services, including long wait lists. While waiting, their child's mental health gets worse and families find themselves desperately seeking a solution, which is what brings them to the emergency department. We do our best to stabilize these children while they are with us, but when they are discharged, they are often still on those wait lists and won't have guaranteed access to support when they return home. This in increases the risk of them returning to the emergency department in crisis again in the future. It could also increase the chances of them needing acute inpatient care. As a provider, I know that if these kids had access to outpatient mental health services, many of these crises could be avoided. That is why increasing Medicaid rates is vital to addressing the current challenges facing children in our state. Nearly half of our patients receiving mental health services rely on Medicaid. Wait times for outpatient mental health care range from two months to two years depending on what the child needs. Due to challenges with hiring staff and increasing demand for care, most of our outpatient services are only available to current Children's Minnesota patients. And even then, we do not have capacity to provide care for every child who needs it. Currently, Medicaid rates for these services are paid well below the cost of providing care. Across all of our outpatient mental health services, we are reimbursed for less than half of our costs, and because costs continue to rise, that level of reimbursement is getting worse. Th this trend is the same for the inpatient services we provide. The current rates are unsustainable, and on average, we operate these vital services at a loss, severely limiting our ability to recruit and re retain the staff needed to meet the growing needs of our patients and families. One of the biggest impacts we can have on the mental health crisis is investing in outpatient care. When you invest in outpatient care, it decreases the pressure on the rest of the system, including the emergency departments, inpatient units, and other more acute services. And investing in inpatient care will ensure the, those services are there for children and families who need them. 
My colleagues and I are working tirelessly to support patients and families, and we need the legislature to support us by making these investments now. Thank you, Senator Wicklin, for your leadership on this bill, and thank you, committee members, for your time. Thank you, Ms. Bruce Boyce. Uh, Ms. Vimont. Vimont. Mm -hmm. Proceed. Madam Chair and committee members, uh, I am Margaret Vimont, Vice President of Growth and Community Services for Nexus Family Healing. As a Minnesota-based agency that provides mental health services across the continuum from high-end residential care to statewide foster care and community-based services, we are also acutely aware of the gaps in our system and the cost to their children, families, and communities. You are as aware as we are of the distressing sign of a fractured and incomplete system of care. Youth are being stranded in emergency rooms and other inappropriate settings. Families cannot find services when they face mental health challenges. Youth who have completed treatment in higher end settings cannot find the services they need to sustain their gains in the community. We know that you share our alarm at the rates of mental health distress in our young people and in our communities. The rate of youth reporting desperation, anxiety, and hopelessness is well reported. Many of those youth and their families are falling into the gaps in our current system, and they have no way to receive the services and connection that will allow them to navigate a path to health and well-being. Today, I represent voices of providers across the state to ask that the legislature prioritize investment in Medicaid outpatient mental health rates. Foundational to fixing our system of care is a Medicaid payment rate that allows provider organizations to meet the dire need of our communities and our state. There is no current way to scale up community-based mental health services to the level required as current rates pay a fraction of the actual cost, as you've heard several times here today. Nexus has had to scale back its community services, close programs, and decline service cultivation due to the current rate levels, and other agencies have closed altogether. We urge you and the committee to place the Medicaid rate issue at the top of the priority list. The cost of inaction is already evident in the suicide rates of our youth and the overuse of detention in hospital settings. A rate repair will allow the sector to build the prevention and community mental health services that will create healing for families and bright futures for our youth and the state. Thank you for your support of a robust mental health system as the critical investment needed by youth and families in Minnesota. Thank you, Ms. Vermont. On Zoom, we have Dr. Steve Sutherland. Great. Thank you for inviting me. Well, uh, and thank you, Madam Chair uh, Wickland and Chair Mann uh, for uh, having us here. Um, I really appreciate Senator Winkler, or excuse me, Senator Wickland. I was referring also to Ms. Winkler that testified earlier. Senator Wickland, for your uh, detail that you discussed at the beginning of this, and then Ms. Brisboy and Ms. Beaumont for uh, all of the detail you put into your testimony. I can stand on the shoulders of that. I will try to give you some relevant examples from northern Minnesota and what we're facing in this similar situation here. One thing I would like to say, uh, I, by the way, I am Division Chair of Psychiatry for Essential Health, and my daily clinical work is in working with youth and families in crisis here in northern Minnesota, which ranges from the Duluth area to the Iron Range to Brainerd. Uh, the, uh, in, for 25 years, I've been practicing in Minnesota and serving in leadership roles, and I've seen what's happened on the Wisconsin side of the border, and I greatly appreciate everything that the state of Minnesota has done to try to stay as far ahead as we can in the world of mental health. We've seen on the Wisconsin side of the border, for instance, significant program closures uh, in Northwest Wisconsin, ranging from uh, Superior to Cumberland to uh, an upcoming closure of a huge children's mental health hospital system in Eau Claire. Uh, and we see this, uh, we hope it's not foreshadowing. We've also seen trends such as an increase in private practices that do not take medical assistance patients. And uh, we have, uh, our, our own dilemmas have centered around uh, trying to continue to build the programs we need to do. Uh, as already presented by Ms. Brisboy and by Chair Wickland, the, uh, some of the impact of the limitation in outpatient services available spills over into the emergency departments. We certainly see that in our region of the state as well. Uh, I'll give you one example that we're working forward on here through Essentia, 
which remains committed to serving people with all insurance coverage and uninsured people is that we have taken the risk of hiring a child and adolescent psychiatric nurse practitioner to be placed in Virginia and Hibbing on the Iron Range. We were able to get that position approved despite the fact that it represents a financial loss to our system. However, the psychotherapist positions that we would like to put alongside that professional have not yet been able to be approved because we cannot show a way to make that something other than a deficit higher. And that would be a useful, I think, real life example of how it becomes very hard for those of us doing work with patients with state insurance programs coverage to build the program that's needed to some very high risk areas of our state. So I will, also, I will wrap up, but I would just like to emphasize and thank the committee. Uh, simply put, Medicaid reimbursement, which is the core source of our funding for patients of all ages in northern Minnesota, like other communities in the state, has been drastically outpaced by the cost of services. And uh, many health systems, including our own at Essentia, are being paid, paid less than 70% of the cost it takes to take care of Medicaid enrollees. And so to take a small but meaningful step towards increasing reimbursement rates to sustainable rates, uh, we ask that lawmakers please uh, make that investment required to uh, be a part of this response to the ongoing mental health, health crisis. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you, doctor. Next up, we have Ann Kramer. Oh. Is that someone in, in, in person? person? Yep. Good morning. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Chair Mann and members of this committee. My name is Ann Kramer, and I'm the Chief uh, Strategy and Development Officer for Neisserman Associates. We're one of the largest um, outpatient providers of mental health services in Minnesota with 43 locations um, located throughout the metro in an outstate Minnesota. Um, in addition to the reasons that have been articulated by the prior testifiers, I'm here today to speak in favor of the bill. And another reason why the bill is so important to mental health providers like us in the state is because of the very real funding deficit that we're facing um, starting January of this year with um, this coming year, excuse me, with the premature um, phase out of the critical access payments. Um, I'd like to just bring the committee's attention to a letter that was submitted um, by six um, so the, the six CEOs of um, six certified mental health clinics um, that, um, and that letter is in the packet that is uh, before the committee. Um, these mental health clinics um, collectively serve over 62,000 Medicaid patients a year. And in this letter, these six organizations, including Nystrom, um, express concern over the upcoming funding gap and their support for the bill that is before you today. Without action this session, access to critical um, mental health services to some of the state's most vulnerable um, are going to be at risk. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Kramer. Yeah. That is the end of our list of testifiers. Anyone else wishing to testify? Seeing no one, uh, members, questions? Senator Abler. Well, thank you, and uh, Senator Wicklund, thanks for bringing the topic forward. This is, uh, I think there could be many more people that would like to testify. Hey, would you like to have rates that actually pay your costs? and all these departments. Um, and so clearly this bill is not going to move this year. It's I don't know how many billions of dollars it costs to catch up. But I think it illustrates, this would certainly be a billion dollar fiscal note, I got to imagine, if not more, if you bring people up to Medicare rates. And I, and I, I think it illustrates the challenge where the state has taken over more responsibility of uh, attempting to provide coverage for people. The reason that the Minsure policies cost so much is that's what they cost. Uh, especially the way that laws have been passed for having more and more benefits added in and uh, with the changes in 2013 and, and all that where some of the more value packages were taken away by insurance companies that thought this was a good chance to make a little bit more money. And so you have all these different pressures on. And so the move and the, the bill coming up later, I'll just comment on that now about Minnesota care for more people. 
um, at the rates that we can afford to pay that we have chosen in a bipartisan way to not properly fund these programs over time is actually resulting in a system that's on the verge of collapse. I think North Memorial is at 64% uh, public paid programs and they are really in hard times. Uh, and for all the services that they love to provide and the ethical and, and committed practice that they've demonstrated and HCMC and other ones like that and some of the, even the more commercial ones like uh, Lina Hospitals and so on feel themselves pressed by the ongoing influx of more people on these public programs. So I think as a legislature and as a government with the governor on down, I think we need to decide are we intending to provide these services or not? We hear story after story from SED providers, mental health providers, just in the last, well, here and then yesterday and in our committees about how they can't work anymore and they're just like not even paying the bills. So um, I'm glad, Senator, this is a, I'm trying to give you at least a sideways compliment for at least having a bill that would say how far out of whack are we with what we're doing? And so I'm interested to see the fiscal note. Um, and, um, but I, I think that this may show that some of our priorities are wrong. I think we bought too many new programs last time in the face of a ton of money that we could have actually solved some of these problems with and, and stabilized our critical indus industries, hospitals, nursing homes, uh, transportation across the state, emergency and not emergency, the providers to people who have come to count on us. So um, th that's just meant to be a comment that's friendly to the topic because here we are and now how do we make sure we keep our word? Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Um, Madam Chair, just a comment. I, I think we can debate, you know, when we should have started to address um, these concerns, whether it was last year or years before that. But I think in, in reality we are facing a crisis and we, this bill, um, I hope, will help us understand, you know, what we can do and um, to actually address it and talk about that rather than um, just talking about it is a crisis and people are leaving and programs are closing. Um, so I, I take your, your point um, and I understand that, but I, I do think that we need to, f we have many people who need care, um, demonstrated need, and so I think we need to talk about solutions. Madam Chair. Senator Amber. And Senator Wicklund, I'm not blaming one party or another, just so you understand that. I think in t if, you've, if somebody before you commits to a, to a policy you don't really like, you still have to pay for it. And so we can, the, dis the decision to add all these folks and all these programs has been made, and it is the policy of the state. Part of my question early in the session was, what else have we done last year that I didn't quite understand that is more policies of the state that were not fully uh, verbalized? But, when you have a policy of the state, it's a policy of the state. And so the Republicans need to figure out what it's gonna cost or change a policy, and the Democrats have to figure out how to continue to fund you know, what those policies are as well. And so I'm happy to, it's, it's not fair to the uh, over a million people that rely on our health systems that they should be lousy and you can't get a dentist and maybe you can't get a mental health provider. So I, that's just, this is not a political debate. This is a, like, what are we going to do now? Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. I mean, if only we didn't have entities siphoning money out of our health care system, right? If only we could spend, like, a fraction of, like, the $22 billion that United took home in profits last year, we would solve this problem. But anyway. <laughs> um, members, other questions? Senator Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Wickland, for bringing this important conversation forward. I'm disappointed to hear that it's not really getting traction in the House because it's a conversation that the entire legislature needs to have. And I think Senator Abler asked the really key question, are, these, are we intending to provide these services or not? And clearly the answer is yes. We have a crisis in our state. We have to bolster our system to ensure that people have the care that they need in Minnesota. This is all about the current and the future of our state. Um, so I appreciate Senator Abler um, distilling it into the question that needs to be asked. Senator Mann, as usual, is spot on. Um, we're spending um, 
a lot of money in health care, um, but it's, it's really uh, concentrated into uh, a few small areas. Uh, we have the resources. We have to take care of our people. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Other comments, questions? Seeing none, any final comments? Uh, no, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, members, for um, the discussion today, and I appreciate that, and um, I, I think it's a conversation we need to continue and, and find out, you know, what, what will it cost, and also look for ways that, you know, are there ways that we can um, be implementing this over time and, and make some plans so that we can make some commitments to people who are providing these services um, and, and addressing the crises, crises in our state. So thank you. Thank you, Senator. Um, next, we'll go to Senate file 4837. And I will remind um, our testifiers to please keep it to two minutes or less, um, as we do have lots of testifiers on the list today. Um, Senator Wicklin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Senate file. 4837 is a bill that provides oversight of health maintenance organization transactions uh, by the Commissioner of Health. Uh, the goals for this bill are to ensure that the public interest is served in relation to assets of charitable or nonprofit health maintenance organizations. It is important to ensure that assets are not diverted to activities that do not further the public interest. A great deal of work has gone into how, how we can best accomplish this when um, and to put that in place um, before the moratorium on conversion transactions um, in, expires, which is now set for June 30th of 2026, as well as providing better oversight than is available today so that we know that our regulatory entities, which includes the Department of Health, the Department of Commerce, and the Attorney General, are able to fairly regulate both nonprofit and for-profit HMOs. The Department of Health has provided a preliminary report, which will be um, followed by a final report due in June this, of this year. In this report, MDH states that there is significant complexity embedded in the state's regulatory structure, the industry it oversees, and the types of financial transactions that are the focus of this report. Um, basically, the, the Department of Health is saying that identifying the right type and level of financial transactions that are appropriate for regulators to examine is complex. The preliminary analysis highlighted several areas where the Department of Health has concerns about gaps in regulatory, regulatory authority. What this bill uh, with the delete all am amendment accomplishes is to give the Department of Health greater oversight. The, de um, the DE, uh, what it would do is apply several statutes in existing law relating to oversight of material insurance transactions, apply them to health maintenance organizations and nonprofit health service plan corporations. It would provide regulatory oversight to the Department of Health over these transactions. It also expands situations in which pre-transaction notice must be provided to the Attorney General. In particular, Minnesota nonprofit HMOs and nonprofit health service plan corporations must provide notice to the Attorney General upon any transfer of, a le of at least 10% of the corporation's assets, as well as upon dis dissolution, merger, consolidation, and conversion. Work um, is underway, and a great deal of work has gone on to this point um, to define the regulatory practices that should be applied for nonprofit conversion transactions. And that is actively proceeding um, with discussions going on with regulatory entities and the stakeholders. As this bill progresses in the Senate and in the other body, I will continue to work with everyone involved to see if regulatory practices can be implemented along with the provisions I have laid out above. Uh, this bill, as amended, will give us a way to close gaps now on key concerns identified by the Department of Health on transactions that could occur, uh, which without this oversight may not serve the public interest. And um, Madam Chair, I'd like to um, adopt the A1 amendment. On the motion to adopt the A1 amendment, author's amendment, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? The amendment is adopted.
And Madam Chair, then uh, we can go to testimony if you'd okay. like. We'll start with Mr. Robert Hader. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Robert Heider, and I am the Legislative Director at Take Action Minnesota. We are a grassroots, multi-peoples organization that believes in a democracy and government that work for us all. For over 15 years, Take Action has worked to promote a people-centered healthcare system. I am here today to share our support for Senate File 4837. We have an opportunity here to learn from experiences in other states, many of whom did not pass conversion regulations until many public benefit assets had already been stripped in the name of corporate greed. In California, a $3 billion transfer of public assets to two foundations came about after Blue Cross initially offered to only donate $100 million to charity. Thanks to strong conversion regulations, they ensured that all of those assets remained a public benefit. Because of conversion protections in Maryland, the insurance commissioner there was able to review the transaction when WellPoint tried to buy care first and hold public hearings around the state. There, they uncovered that $75 million was set to go to corporate executives. That conversion was found to be not in the public interest and it was denied. In Ohio, a controversial conversion proposal from one nonprofit inspired conversion legislation that was employed in a subsequent merger between a nonprofit and Anthem. But the review of the merger was not open to the public, only $28 million in assets were protected, and the board of the new foundation included a, a for-profit insurer. A lot is at stake in getting this right. These examples from other states point to the importance of four things, all of which this bill does well. The Attorney General will have the opportunity to review conversions, gather independent assessment of value, and protect public assets for the public interest. The public has the opportunity to have input into these decisions. The govern governance of the resulting conversion benefit entity is independent and responsive to community needs. And the Department of Health is notified of a broader set of transactions so that they can analyze trends and be alert to emerging concerns or gaps in the regulations. We urge you to support strong regulations and consumer protections to ensure that public assets are used for public good and not converted to corporate profits. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Heider. We'll move to Zoom to Mr. Michael Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for the opportunity to speak in favor of uh, Senate File 4837. I'm a former public policy director for Blue Shield of California, which is one of the largest nonprofit health plans in the country. Uh, in that role, I came to know a lot about how nonprofit plans approach their duties as nonprofits and how many of them don't fully acknowledge those duties. In fact, uh, Blue Shield of California has quietly but officially asserted that it has no duty as a nonprofit to serve the public good. That was a position I disagreed with and that led me to leave the organization in 2015. Uh, since then, I've spent uh, much of my time advocating for increased accountability on the part of nonprofit health plans. In essence, what a nonprofit organization is, is an entity that exists to serve the public good. That's why they're generally eligible for tax exemptions. And in accordance with its duty to operate for public benefit, a nonprofit is obligated to use its assets or resources exclusively for public benefit. Uh, this principle is particularly important when you're talking about nonprofit healthcare organizations because of how big they are. As an example, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Minnesota alone holds a surplus of over a billion dollars, which represents just a portion of the total value of its assets. You know, so the, the public has a very big stake in ensuring that these resources and those of every nonprofit health plan and HMO are preserved for public benefit. Uh, when the directors of a nonprofit plan or HMO decide to convert the entity into a for-profit, and there could be, under certain circumstances, good reasons to do that, a very substantial risk arises based on what you've, you've just heard has, has happened in other states. 
Uh, a big risk arises that the public will not receive its due, that in the course of the transaction, the nonprofit assets, which are held in trust for the public, will be devaluated uh, or in some other, or, you know, or that some of those assets will be diverted into, into private hands. So given the stakes for the public in these transactions, it just makes good sense, in my view, to have a clear and transparent regulatory process governing them that ensures the preservation of those nonprofit assets for the benefit of the public. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. I'll call up to the table former Senator Michelle Benson and Dan Andreessen. No worries. Mr. Andreessen, please proceed. Madam Chair, members of the committee, Dan Andreessen with the Minnesota Council of Health Plans. The council is still reviewing the language in the bill and is committed with working with uh, Chair Wicklin as this bill moves along. Um, however, the council does contend that this bill is premature. Um, as been mentioned, uh, the Department of Health is studying this um, situation right now and reports coming out this summer. Um, and so the council suggests that before the legislature enact new regulations that we wait for that study um, and use those findings in any future legislation. Um, also, as mentioned, that there is a conversion moratorium in place in statute, uh, so we don't think there's any need for immediate uh, need to enact regulations. Um, that moratorium was put in place in 2017 after the legislature removed the requirement that all HMOs operating in state regulated markets must be nonprofit. The council opposed that change at that time because we believe that entities in healthcare should be not for profit. Minnesota was the last state in the country to have that requirement. This conversion moratorium is in effect until July 1st, 2026, and it was reauthorized last session. Now, proponents argue that there is a need for this new regulation out of concern that a nonprofit HMO would convert to be a for profit entity. If that is a concern and you want to stop this from happening, Rather than creating new regulations, you could simply revisit the topic of licensing HMOs in Minnesota. Reversing the 2017 decision and reenacting the requirement that HMOs must be nonprofit would stop any future conversion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Andreessen. Uh, that is the end of our list of testifiers. Members. Senator Aki. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, uh, my first question, uh, Senator Wicklund, if you could help us, help me out with this, is it was just brought up in testimony, and I had this note from earlier, is the fact, why would we be doing the build now when we've asked DHS to report effective the end of June? Shouldn't we wait until we have that data from the report before we proceed forward with the bill? Um. Senator Whitley. Thank you, Senator Utke, uh, Madam Chair, Senator Utke. I believe that the reason we're bringing it forward now is that um, the Department of Health did provide a preliminary report, which was substantial. Um, they did identify key areas of concern that we are not able to have the proper um, regulatory oversight into, and um, they also provided data on, on other um, aspects of conversion uh, regulation practices. Uh, that, that we can use to um, create language. And I think there's a sense of urgency to make sure that we do have proper regulatory oversight in place um, so that the Department of Health and being responsible for health maintenance organizations um, has the proper authority. Senator Ecke. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you. I just am not comfortable working with preliminary data versus all of the data and the f fact that this is in effect yet till July 1 of 2026. I think we're comfortable in moving forward and uh, having a full discussion next year so that we work with all the data before we make a decision. So thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Madam Chair. And it's like um, a, a moment of synergy, and not about the Hartford Whalers, by the way. I just want to tell you the, um, but, but to hear Senator Abler say North Memorial, 64% of the money 
the pay, payer payer is, Medi is it's public, right? It's public, so it's Medicaid, Medicare, right? And then, and you talk about the need for a public benefit, and I, I think about Scott Magnuson's dad, Richard Magnuson, was one of the legal people who helped set up the HMOs years ago, called Group Health, right? And and you think about what they were supposed to be, and then to hear Dr. Senator Mann say, 22 billion of a of a corporation that's making money on bequest on the behalf of public entities, right? Medicaid, Medicare. That doesn't sit well. Never has. I think 10 years ago on the Senate floor, I listed a, a list, and I won't name the HMO, but they're in Minnesota. Top 22 people made $33 million a year. That was 10 years ago. Um, I think I still have that list. But there's got to be something in this bill that is absolutely wonderful because of the fact it's starting to say, oh, there's some transparency here. I don't think Richard Magnuson wanted the HMOs to look the way they do now, especially when we're talking about mental health crisis in Minnesota, which would cost a billion dollars. The, the fiscal note, just here on the table, um, Senator Wickland, was probably a billion dollars. We desperately need that being taken care of. Yet, at the same time, what's happening in the world of medicine on that side of it, thanks to Dr. Mann and, and folks that are saying it, it really is a sad moment. And I'm glad you're bringing this forward, and I would hope that we can do something even this year on it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Abler. Well, thanks, Madam Chair and Senator Wickland. I, I don't know about the timing part. Um, that will work itself out. I don't have an opinion about that. I do have an uh, I have a... Uh, I was part of helping for-profit HMOs uh, work in the Medicaid area, and I'm not convinced I was right about that. Um, and I remember uh, in the day we were worried about closing the regional treatment centers, and we passed a law saying you can't, you can't close them. And so then DHS just took all the patients away. And then so what should we do with these vacant buildings? Uh, I think uh, Blue Cross has run as big a truck through the nonprofit. Um, they love it when I say this, but, um, but they have all these for-profit subsidiaries. And so, but they're still nonprofit. I think uh, UCARE is an example of a, of a health plan with ethics that actually focuses to serve. And so how do we keep the design of, of a company like that, which has gone out of its way to help everybody that can possibly help? They pay lousy rates, by the way, uh, to your other bill. Um, but, their, but their ethical commitment is there. And so um, I think the discussion of what is an HMO to really do and what is their duty and can you have a bunch of for-profits that are under your umbrella and still pretend you're, an, you're a non-profit? So I, I think the discussion is worthwhile. And I, uh, I'm happy to encourage you to continue with that. I might even sign on to your bill. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Other comments? Questions? Seeing none, Senator, do you have any final comments? Um, no, thank you, uh, members, for the, the good discussion. I think this is a, it's a complex topic, and it is um, dense, but I think it's very important because we all have a sense that we want to protect um, assets that are public um, from being used in a way that, that wouldn't meet our criteria for, for public use. So um, I hope to continue to work with the stakeholders. As, we, as the bill moves forward. So thank you. Thank you, Senator. So Senator Wickliffe's motion is that Senate File 4837, as amended, be recommended to pass and be referred to judiciary. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, the bill passes. Next up, we have Senate File 4778. Senator. Thank you very much. I am very happy to be able to bring forward uh, Senate File 4778. Um, we have, this is the Minnesota Care Public Option Bill. Um, in Minnesota, we believe everyone deserves access to health care, no matter our race, income, age, or zip code. But many Minnesotans lack an affordable choice for quality health coverage that actually covers the care they need. Minnesota has long been a healthcare leader, taking bold action and finding innovative solutions to our state's evolving healthcare needs, because we know it's the right thing to do. And we have made progress, both at the state and national level. The Affordable Care Act slashed Minnesota's uninsured rate, it expanded Medicaid, and for the first time offered people without employer coverage financial assistance, 
and coverage without pre-existing pre -existing condition exclusions and patchwork benefits. We know that rates of an uninsurance, underinsurance, and uncompensated care have improved. However, as Minnesotans, we don't sit back and admire our progress. We keep moving forward. We recognize that there are many that this is, is not an improvement or has not been an improvement for, and there is work ahead, and we accept the challenge. Up to 5% of Minnesotans remain uninsured. Also, 50% of the enrollees who, um, who buy on the MinSure exchange are in slimmer coverage through bronze or catastrophic plans, and 60% of families getting coverage through MinSure have a $10,000 deductible or more. Too many families fa still face undue stress and financial hardship when it comes to medical bills, resulting in delayed or avoided care, even when they have coverage. We can do better with the state and federal dollars we contribute toward this care, and we should do better. Minnesota Care was founded in 1992 to extend affordable coverage to low-income working families. Over the years, it was consistently expanded to groups in need of affordable coverage options, moving up the income scale, we added adults without children, closing the family glitch, and more. Last year, we took an important step forward, again, authorizing the Departments of Commerce and Human Services to commission a ro ro excuse me, an robust analysis on a public option from a trusted actuarial firm. That analysis covered enormous ground, reviewing a number of scenarios and surfacing a wealth of information to guide our work. This bill that I'm presenting today was developed based on what we learned from that analysis, creating a unique form of public option that leverages our Minnesota Care program. This program will allow those that don't have access to affordable employer-based health insurance to purchase Minnesota Care at a sliding premium scale modeled after the kind of scale that already exists through the, under the ACA. Just as in Minnesota Care, benefits are comprehensive, including vision and dental, with reasonable co-pays. Households over 400% of the federal poverty level will also pay a <coughs> modest deductible. Enrollment limits in the first two plan years would support a smooth and predictable transition period. The program is also designed to capture federal dollars and maximize the impact of state dollars. This bill also takes a comprehensive approach to affordability in the years leading up to the public option through targeted wraparound subsidies that help Minnesotans purchasing coverage in the individual market by higher value coverage and through a new tax credit that better targets state premium assistance to those who need it. Taken all together, I believe these proposals in this bill will improve access to the health care Minnesotans deserve now and into the future. And Madam Chair, I'd like to proceed to, oh, I should say we have a, an amendment that I'd like to adopt. Senator has an A1 author's amendment. All those in favor of the amendment, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, the amendment is adopted. Uh, with that. If we can move to testifiers. Perfect. Thank you. We'll start with Ms. Hannah McMillan on Zoom. Thank you. Uh, my name is Hannah McMillan, um, dear Chair Wicklin and members of the Health and Human Services Committee. I am here today to speak in favor for a public option in Minnesota. I grew up in Wapasha in a household that was below the poverty line and we did not have the option to go to the doctor whenever we needed and we would avoid seeing a doctor until it was absolutely necessary many times until there was no option. Preventative care or yearly checkups were not an option for us. We relied on free clinics, which helped us immensely, but relying on them is neither sustainable or adequate to ensure health and well-being of Minnesotans. There were several times throughout my childhood that 
my siblings or I would get injured or really sick and we wouldn't be able to get care because I had two other siblings at home and it would have been a choice between the family being able to get to eat and getting um, the care that was needed. If there was ever an issue that needed more specialized care than um, the primary doctor in Wabasha, we would have to travel to Rochester and the transportation costs for that, as well as cost of gas and childcare for younger siblings um, was a large burden for us. Growing up, having any health issues felt like a major burden on my family and it was exhausting. So I urge you today to support legislation that prioritizes the needs of families like mine when I was a child. I believe the public option will respond to our needs by putting people first and by expanding access to Minnesota care. And I believe this bill will save lives. Together we can build a healthier, more equitable future for all. And again, please uh, support the public option. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McMillan. We will move on to Megan Paul, and I will call down Simone Blaylock to the table as well. Ms. Paul, please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you. Um, my name is Megan Paul. Um, I live in Richfield. Um, I've been chronically ill all of my life, with it worsening since I've become an adult. This requires many doctor's appointments, hospital visits, medications. In the last five years, I've accumulated over $70,000 of medical debt that is sitting in collections due to insurance not covering services that I desperately need or um, they say they're going to cover them and then don't and I end up with surprise bills. In 2021, I qualified for Minnesota Care. It was the best health insurance I had received. My chronic conditions were able to be well managed because I could access the care that I needed, which kept me out of the hospital. However, last year, my projected income changed due to an hourly raise, so I no longer qualified for Minnesota Care. My hours at work are not guaranteed, so I cannot afford my current health insurance premium for insurance that doesn't even cover many of the doctors that I was seeing under Minnesota Care. My health has worsened again, which has put me in and out of the ER since the beginning of the year. I am not able to work as much due to this, which has led to needing community assistance for things like rent, utilities, and my health insurance premium. The public option would help me be able to better manage my health, which would keep me out of the hospital for longer periods of time. I wouldn't have to make the regular decision between seeking health care and going into debt or paying for rent and groceries. Having a public option would mean paying a reasonable price and having access to the excellent health care that I had when I was on Minnesota Care, which would relieve so many of the current burdens and barriers I am facing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ball. Ms. Blaylock. Hello, Chair Wicklund and members of the committee. My name is Simone Blaylock and I live in Rosemount. I've been a home care worker for 17 years and I care for my son, Xavier. He has a chromosome disorder and an intellectual uh, disability as well as on the autism spectrum. In addition, I work with another client during the daytime. Um, I'm a member of the SEIU. Healthcare Minnesota and Iowa. Our union represents 50,000 healthcare workers. Our union supports the bill to create a Minnesota Care public option. The bill will provide more affordable public health insurance for tens of thousands of Minnesotans, and it could help people like me. I'm part of this fight because I believe care, healthcare workers deserve decent health care. We need adequate health insurance so we can care for our children and our clients. If we can't be healthy, how can we keep others safe and healthy? I am an insulin dependent, diabetic, and I have high blood pressure. My two chronic medical conditions require medications and many visits to the doctor. Uh, right now I'm on a high quality public uh, insurance program. I have low out of pocket costs. That keeps me healthy to take care of Xavier, and it keeps me working and caring for him as well as working for my other client. It keeps me from needing more expensive treatments that would cost taxpayers even more money. Um, I worry about what will happen if I lose my current health care. 
For example, what happens if I start to earn too much to qualify for Minnesota Care? I could possibly get a private insurance, um, uh, Minsure, but I might not be able to be uh, afford a plan with high co-pays and deductibles. Now, every visit and every medication could put me in a financial hole. Will I be afraid to go to the doctor because of this cost? But if I get sick, who will care for Xavier? Sometimes I sit and cry and wonder about this because sometimes this whole healthcare system can be so impossible. This isn't just for me. If we expand public health insurance, we can help the next generation of home care workers. I'm thinking about the people who may have to take care of Xavier in the future. Please vote yes, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Blaylock. Next up, can we have Tessa Parks and Dan Andreessen come to the table? Ms. Parks, you can introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you, Chairman, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Tessa Sadai Parks. My spouse, Wyatt, and I own and operate WT Farms in Northfield, Minnesota, and I'm the newly elected president of the Rice County Farmers Union. On behalf of myself and MFU, I'm glad to share my strongest support for Chair Wickland's bill to establish a Minnesota Care public option. This is a top priority for our organization because too many farmers are stuck paying premiums for care they can't afford to use. They are skipping buying insurance altogether and are just one accident away from losing what could be generations of investment in their family farm. As first generation farmers, healthcare is a defining barrier that limits our ability to realize our dream of farming full time. We're trapped in this cycle of depending on off farm jobs to, for income to cover our basic living expenses and then not having enough time to invest in, our growing, in growing our farm that we hope to acquire a permanent home for one day. This spring, my husband will be moving to full-time farm work, yet we still earn too much to qualify for Minnesota Care, but earn too little to afford quality insurance on the individual market. And we need quality insurance, because we are young and would like to start even thinking about having a family. I'm passionate about farming. Most days, I think I'm good at it, and we already invested so much into building what we have. To think that I have to choose between my dream of farming alongside Wyatt and starting a family with him is so incredibly frustrating. It's also disheartening to think of the many young people who want to do something entrepreneurial in our state. Maybe they want to farm like me, or start a welding shop to contribute to building new green energy projects, or start a rural veterinary practice, which we so desperately need. But they can't take that next step because they can't afford to leave their employer-sponsored insurance. I know I can't. The status quo is a problem for me, and it's a big loss for our communities. I know we can do better. I'm counting on you to take the next big step in ensuring affordable health care for every Minnesotan. I know we I know we can do it. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and for your work on this proposal. Thank you, Ms. Parks. Mr. Andreessen. Madam Chair, members of the committee, Dan Andreessen, again with the Council of Health Plans. Uh, so we understand the challenges of health care affordability and our members want to be constructive in finding solutions, uh, but are concerned about the establishment of a public option program. Last session, we testified that there are several questions that we'd need to be answered before proceeding. Uh, and we're still waiting for some of those answers, such as commercial market impacts, uh, projected stability to individual group markets, um, and cost shifting. Um, also, what will, will be the response to providers and how will re reimbursement rates impact and really access to care if providers favor commercially insured patients because Minnesota care rates are too low. Uh, this is something we already see happening uh, in the Medicaid market uh, for enrollees getting access to dental care. Uh, but as we debate this topic, let's come back to what, what problem are we trying to solve and how quickly can we solve it? And we've heard today concerns about insurance premiums, out-of-pocket costs, uh, people being in bronze little products that don't work for them. And so the solution being proposed today is to increase subsidization of those costs, uh, putting them into a Minnesota care program where they're paying less out-of-pocket uh, for their products. Um, if the legislature is open to subsidization, there's a much simpler solution to this, and that's to just subsidize a market or subsidize a product on the exchange that would mirror Minnesota Care's actuarial value. The council worked with RAN this summer to model this approach, and it is a possible option. It would be a platinum level product, so cost sharing would be low. Typically, this means a higher premium, but that would be offset by state funded premium subsidies. This plan will be open to anyone, and you could target those subsidies uh, based on a certain income level, similar to what subsidies you see uh, currently in the market. So we're getting people out of those bronze level products. 
Uh, this is something the state could implement faster than a public option, uh, would not cause the provider payment shifts um, that we're going to hear about, as well as could be done in a more cost-effective way compared to a public option. Timing of this decision is important given the simultaneous expiration of the ARPA subsidies and state reinsurance program, which is projected to impact 87,000 people in the individual market. The council has worked closely with policymakers to find solutions to challenges and uh, look forward to working with Chair Wicklin on this issue as it goes forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Andreessen. I'll call up Mr. Bentley Graves and Ms. Michelle Benson to the table. Mr. Graves, if you can introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. My name is Bentley Graves from the Minnesota Chamber of, Host or Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> the majority of Minnesotans, roughly 60%, access health insurance covers through their employer. These and other Minnesotans in the commercial market pay doctors and hospitals more than twice as much as the Minnesota Care Program pays these providers today. For better or worse, these higher payments ensure health care providers have the resources needed to pay staff, operate and maintain facilities, expand service offerings, and invest in the new treatments, procedures, and devices that improve the health of the lives of the Minnesotans they serve. For better or worse, these higher payments drive Minnesota's accessible and quality healthcare ecosystem. But Senate File 4778 raises significant concerns about the impact the public option could have on that ecosystem. In its first year, it's estimated this public option will cover 107,000 people. 70% of whom are expected to move to it from private coverage in the individual market, which pays doctors and hospitals at the higher commercial rate. The effect of the public option then would be to reduce by half the amount doctors and hospitals are paid to care for these new public option enrollees. Already 60% of Minnesota hospitals have negative operating margins, and yet costs from labor to supplies are rising. Under public option, with a growing number of patients walking through their doors, paying less than what it costs to deliver care, how will they continue to do all the things that they do today? Will doctors and hospitals be forced to pull back on the services they currently offer? Will they make up the lost revenue by charging those with private insurance even more? We have other questions as well. Among them, why does the plan assume that none of the roughly 60% of Minnesotans who currently have coverage through their employer will transition to the public option? Why are we considering a plan for a public option that assumes that the majority of the public won't consider this option? What if they did? With more lives covered, wouldn't the state costs increase, especially for this population since there would be no subsidy from the federal pass-through funds? And if we did see a shift in coverage like this, wouldn't that exacerbate the access and cross-subsidization issues from doctors and hospitals payments being cut in half for an increasing number of their patients? The cost of healthcare is too high. Minnesotan families, all in healthcare costs, are already third highest in the country. But trying to fix this by arbitrarily slashing payments to providers invites a host of potentially harmful unintended consequences for Minnesotans' access to care and the cost paid by the majority of Minnesotans. Mr. Grace. These have long been our concerns about a public option like this, and they remain unchanged today. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Ms. Benson. Thank you, Madam Chair, Senator Wicklin, and committee members. There's no panacea in health care, and you know this better than anyone. Senate File 4778 will upend Minnesota's health care ecosystem with an expansion of government payer rates that will have a significant impact on access and quality. There will be impacts on the existing health insurance market, yes. It will erode and then sunset the individual insurance market. The public option will probably diminish the small group employer coverage market when small businesses opt for ICRA plans instead of small group. Cost shifting in care systems will raise costs for employers and union negotiated coverage. Even at Medicare rates, cost shifting will be significant. Our hospitals and care systems are already financially strained. So how will lower payments improve the long-term stability of our strained healthcare system? To remain viable, systems will have to cut expenses, including wages. This committee knows nursing homes with a larger government payer mix historically pay wages for RNs that are below hospital system pay. Rural health systems with more limited access to commercial payers will have increasing difficulty competing for doctors, nurses, and other essential providers simply because they will have less money available to pay competitive compensation. You've heard nursing homes in crisis. 
mental health providers in crisis because of the high mix of government rates. Moving to a public option will increase the government payer mix. So how will this improve the viability and stability of our health system? And on another note, we will once again be relying on Minsure to implement a plan rapidly, single sourced. It didn't work last time, cost hundreds of millions of dollars, and I would urge caution as we move forward. The Health Plan Partnership of Minnesota opposes Senate File 4778 because it will destabilize our fragile healthcare ecosystem and reduce access and quality across the system. Thank you, Madam Chair, members. Thank you. Can okay, Mr. Ben Wagner and Abby Lesh please come down to the table? Mr. Wagner, please introduce yourself and proceed. Madam Chair, members of this committee, good morning. My name is Ben Wagner. I'm here today with Medical Alley. Medical Alley represents a global network of more than 800 leading health technology and care companies from all corners of the state of Minnesota. With access, affordability, and quality as top priorities, Medical Alley and our partners are committed to developing solutions which drive meaningful change and save lives. It's with these guiding principles that we express deep concern about Senate File 4778. This proposal would create a significant financial risk to hospitals as medical professionals perform services at lower reimbursement rates. Hospitals are already under severe financial distress and expanding such a reimbursement structure would put them in a situation where they may be forced to shutter services or close altogether, significantly impacting patient access to care. This would hit greater Minnesotans especially hard as our rural residents already travel longer distances to receive inpatient care. In order to pay for this proposal, healthcare costs will inevitably have to go up across the ecosystem. Raising the provider tax will likely become a necessity to maintain the low premiums that current Minnesota care enrollees already pay. This tax on providers goes up, and so does the cost of care for patients. If health systems are left with even fewer financial resources, providers may be forced to lay off and reduce lay off staff and reduce services, resulting in a lower quality of care for patients. As you know, hospitals already face widespread staffing shortages. This bill will only exacerbate this challenge, leading to longer wait times for emergency care and other admissions. Medical Alley and our partners share the goal of increasing affordable access to health care coverage for all Minnesotans. However, any proposal that would destabilize providers' ability to deliver for patients is the wrong mechanism to achieve that goal. It would threaten access to health care and could lead to higher costs for consumers. Medical Alley respectfully urges legislators to oppose Senate File 4778. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wagner. Perfect timing. Ms. Lesh. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Abby Loesch, and I'm here on behalf of the Minnesota Business Partnership, which represents many of Minnesota's largest employers, employing almost half a million workers across the state. Minnesota ranks near the top in the nation for health care coverage, and we are grateful to our many world-class health care providers headquartered here in Minnesota. Health care affordability, access, and equity are very important to our members, and I want to express some of our concerns regarding Senate File 4778. While we share the goal of affordable and accessible health care, this bill is not the way to improve the state's health care system. This bill will increase cost shifting onto commercial policyholders in both the self and fully insured markets to compensate for lower government reimbursement rates. Consequently, higher healthcare expenses passed on to private insurers will inevitably in result in increased rates for those en enrolled in employer-sponsored health insurance programs. This proposal could reduce access to healthcare and increase costs as the limitations of cost shifting are reached. With a growing public payer population, Healthcare providers will face mounting challenges in offsetting lower reimbursement rates. This could force providers, especially those already operating on thin margins, to reduce services, particularly in rural and underserved areas. Despite being home to numerous world-class healthcare providers, this bill threatens to erode the industry's competitive edge and puts Minnesota at a disadvantage to attract global talent to our state, particularly amidst a workforce shortage. 
We currently have no way of knowing the full scope of consequences this could have for Minnesota patients, providers, employers, and taxpayers. We respectfully ask the committee members oppose Senate File 4778. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Loesch. Uh, I'll call down Danny Eckert and Rihanna Lee. Mr. Eckert, please introduce yourself and proceed. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Danny Eckert with the Minnesota Hospital Association. Although the Hospital Association is very much pro-coverage and staunch supporters of Minnesota Care, we remain concerned given that the rush process to pass Senate File 4778 indefinitely relies on hospitals and health systems to provide care 24-7, 365. This reliance is assumed without establishing key details on state administrative operations and without much, if any, consideration for the potential impact on increasing the scale at which providers are reimbursed well below cost. As such, we urge lawmakers to pause and take more time to address several of the remaining unanswered issues regarding the proposed public option program, many identified by the Department of Commerce. Without doing this first, it, almost, it is almost certain that compounding unintended consequences will significantly harm the very health care system that the public option is trying to improve. We urge the legislature to first fully identify the cost of creating, administrating, and providing the necessary administrative and technological support for this government program. Second, codify precise estimates of how many individuals would drop private coverage and move into the public option rather than casually assuming that this number is non-existent. And three, or third, address the issue of proposed below cost provider payments on sustaining the already precarious state of workforce, care capacity, and patient access. Under the proposed public option, it is estimated that Minnesota's nonprofit hospitals would see an annual loss in revenues of roughly $203 million. While the bill language currently establishes Medicare level payments, please know that Medicare, while better, a better payer than Medicaid, still plays, pays 20% below cost and well below commercial uh, rates. Such losses would have significant impact on access to care as some hospitals would not be able to remain fully in operation and certainly more services would have to be reduced or are completely shut down. This would be particularly hard on rural communities. And as with the mental health rates bill that we just discussed a moment ago that we fully support, uh, that we are concerned about the current and the future and how to get to the future if the services that Minnesotans need are not reimbursed fully. Uh, there are more certain available ways to accomplish uh, uh, people affording their health insurance without rushing to a public option, largely based on incomplete and unknown analysis. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Director. Ms. Lee. Good morning, members of the committee. My name is Rihanna Lee. I am the Legislative and Coalitions Director for Americans for Prosperity here in Minnesota. I did submit a letter uh, that outlines in detail our strong opposition to the public option, along with several attachments that are uh, solutions that we can take today that offer uh, affordable solutions that increase access to care. Uh, we are strongly opposed to the public option because of the failure that it has been in other states. Uh, the significant cost to taxpayers and the decrease in care quality that is the direct result of government interference in health care. We know that the public option has flopped in three states. There are vast issues with care, qu cost, quality, reduced patient access, and studies actually show that most people are satisfied with their current coverage and what they are not looking for is more government involvement in their care and options. We do have significant concerns with the cost of the program. In Medicaid expansion states, actual costs have been double the projected amounts and one of the biggest contributors, contributors to that is the woodwork effect and you get people signing up for these plans because they heard of a new benefit and migration from other plans as uh, testifiers before me have mentioned. Uh, and Private plans do significantly subsidize the public option and cost subscribers more to make up for the steep cuts imposed by government-run health care. And I'd just like to remind everybody that there is no such thing as anything being truly free. Uh, however, there are tried and proven ways that instead of expanding the scope of government, expand consumer choices. Examples include enacting safe harbor bills for direct primary care like Senator Liskey's bill in Senate File 4458, uh, removing barriers to allow more physicians to 
practice in the state, and Senator Mann's bill, Senate File 404, that would allow uh, medical assistance enrollees to opt out of managed care. I did, uh, as I mentioned, include a list of solutions that we can take today that take a bottom-up approach that put those in the community first, rather than top-down, one-size-fits-all solutions that we see with the public option. Um, we, there are a lot of things that we need to do at the federal level, and we know that, but there are measures that we can take here at the state level um, to put patients in control of the care that they need. The public option is not the way. We do stand ready to help build strong bipartisan le legislation that provides, that prioritizes freedom, transparency, and personal choice. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Tom Wright. Welcome, please introduce yourself and proceed. Good morning, Chair Mann and members. Um, I'm Tom Wright. I'm here today representing the Minnesota Association of Health Underwriters, the trade group uh, representing health and benefit agents. Um, our members are serving um, seniors, individuals, and companies in communities across the, across the state. While we feel the main goal of this bill is to provide more competition for insurance carriers, we feel it fails to do so and will have several unintended consequences that are not being considered. Um, competition is great. But in Minnesotans, we you know, appreciate a level playing field, and this bill in no way provides fair competition. It's not hard to see how the premiums will be a fraction of the premiums of commercial carriers when the public option cuts payments to hospitals and clinics in half and pays none of the taxes that commercial plans pay. In the individual market, the artificially lower premiums will shift the cost to commercial plans. In addition, the subsidies and subsidized limits on cost sharing will be a death blow to the individual market and lead carriers to withdraw from the market similar to the crisis in 2017. In the small group market, there is no requirement that small groups offer coverage and many employers will discontinue their small group plans and send them to Minsure to buy the public option. This will not only erode the small group market, but will shift future premium increases to employees. Also, group plans are required to maintain a minimum percentage participation to employees to keep their group policies in place. Employers, employees who don't participate because they move to individual plans or a public option, march, uh, option uh, count against that participation rate. So if enough employees in the group move to the public options, their employers could be disqualified from offering group plans, further eroding the commercial market and leaving their fellow employees with a higher, uh, higher cost due to losing their um, uh, employer premium contributions. Another likely outcome is clients will have trouble getting appointments. Mr. Wright, I'll have you wrap up your comments, please. Okay. Yeah, I think collectively, you know, our feeling is, is that, you know, overall the public option, given these facts, you know, just will further destabilize the health, uh, the health system, and, and we we're asking you to vote now. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wright. Um, Senator, did you have any thoughts you wanted to share right away? Yeah. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I'd just like to address three things. Um, number one, rates. We are totally understand that um, if we were to utilize our current rates in a in extend to this public option, that that would not be um, that would not work. Um, that's why it, we have included Medicare rates as the the payment level, um, and I would like to say, I mean, if Medicare is, rates are, are not acceptable, then I'd like to see more information about what, you know, what that is, um, what, what the difference is. Um, because we keep saying we would increase rates, and it seems like it's never enough. Um, second, I'd like to say that we created the bill so we can get a fiscal note and understand the administrative, operational, and um, implementation costs. That's why we're doing it. And so that fiscal note is in progress and will give us, provide us the information we need. And then last, um, several testifiers indicated that we hadn't considered that um, people might choose to leave from the, the, 
the employer-sponsored insurance market. The way the, the bill is written, it's included in Minnesota Care statute, and it, because Minnesota Care statute says that if an offer of affordable um, employer-sponsored insurance is available, a uh, person is not eligible to apply for Minnesota Care today. That that is the existing rule, and so that rule will be extended. So um, they're not allowed to. Uh, participate and so um, I just wanted to comment it is something we've thought about um, we understand that the market place is um, is complex and uh, we are taking that into consideration so just wanted to make those comments right now thanks thank you madam chair members questions comments senator Rocky thank you madam chair um, I just want to thank everyone for their comments and concerns a couple bills back when we had the informational hearing concerning behavioral health and the whole conversation revolved around the fact that when we have below cost reimbursements, we're losing providers, we can't keep our doors open and we can't offer the services that are needed. Members, this bill is doing just that. We're gonna expand our below cost reimbursements by expanding um, Minnesota Care. But I do have a question to lead things off that I would like to see if somebody here could give me the answer on. How do the benefit sets between Minnesota Care and the commercial plans compare? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Senator Edke, I mean, just at a basic level, I mean, it depends on the plan. Uh, it depends on where, <clears throat> excuse me, where the insured is buying the plan. I mean, I, they compare um, Minnesota Care actual, has an actual aerial value. Um, just like you can find on the commercial market or individual market. So it depends what plan you're comparing it to. Senator Rocky. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. I think that's something that would be beneficial to everybody involved is to see what the difference in coverages really are um, before we move forward because um, I think AI is answering my question. Yeah. And, and <laughs> Senator Rocky, we have someone from DHS who can answer that question. Thank you. Yeah. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Members, Gio Hayes with the Department of Human Services. Uh, Senator Ucky, to your question. Uh, in aggregate, the benefit set for Minnesota care is more generous than that in the individual market. Senator Ucky. More generous than what? than those in the individual market. Um, comparing what type of plan are you referencing there? Madam Chair, Senator Rucky, every Minnesota care plan, regardless of who the uh, managed care organization is, has the same benefit set. If you compare the 62 chapters to 256L, which includes parts of 256B, the aggregate is that there are more benefits offered in Minnesota care, regardless of who the insurance company is, relative to the QHP requirements. Senator Rucky. Thank you. Um, I go back to, well, you know what, I'm going to jump into some questions first and then we'll go back to that. Um, there's references in a number of places in here, and I was only one of the testifiers that touched a little bit on um, the insurance agent interaction with this, and it's talking about the producer, um, and it's got the... Uh, compensation and stuff, and there's no answers to any of that yet, and that's fine, but it's talking about the certification requirements. Um, a licensed insurance agent is, by the nature of what they do, licensed to sell insurance. They're already working with Minsure. Is this requiring an addition, additional certification for them to work with uh, this new plan? Senator Wickley. Um, Senator Utke, I, I don't believe there is new, but I, I don't know if anyone from Minter would be able I to answer someone, that question. I see someone coming up. M Madam Chair. Go ahead. Peter Brickwoody, Assistant Commissioner at the Commerce Department. Senator Utke, we would not read this as imposing any new, um, uh, new requirements on insurance producers. Nothing additional? No. Thank you. And thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I kind of assume so. I'm not a health agent. I do the property casually, but knowing what they all go through also, 
that they would be fully qualified. Um, the, the one part, and it's been brought up here in other conversations, it's part of this bill, is moving people to the silver plan. Um, those things are good. It was brought up by the industry, too. We have people that buy the bronze plans and think they have insurance, and they, you know, they do, but it doesn't cover as much, and it has large deductibles, and in the end, for a lot of them, it's, it, it's not affordable to use. So um, that will keep people on the right track. But um, I guess I've got lots of different things there. But just a couple comments um, back to the access, and most of my focus on this is, of course, rural Minnesota, because that's where I come from. Um, We've got small hospitals and small towns, and we have seen what's happened to our dentists over the last number of years. Actually, for quite a while, it's been this way. Um, when we have a heavier population of, in that case, the Medicaid or medical assistance uh, patient, they have to limit who they can see. Um, and so in the end, we have reduced care. And to me, we're heading down that same road when we are reimbursing at a below cost rate. At some point, our providers have got to start sorting through who they can actually spend their time with. Um, and we know that, and I could go through the hospitals in my area, but they all are right on the fence right now. They don't have any wiggle room to take any less reimbursement in because um, they're already operating in the red, as the data has showed us this last year. So um, to me, this, the, the math just doesn't add up. And as, as much as we would like to make sure everybody has affordable health care and is covered, I don't believe this bill accomplishes that. Um, you know, and one other thing, uh, and it's been brought up even this year again, how many hospitals in the metro area, do we subsidize their reimbursement rates because their medical assistant clientele or patient list is above the average? We can all name quite a few that we have to pay from, the state has to pay more so that they can afford to keep the doors open. All these things just reinforce the fact that this is not a good idea. So. Um, I'll stop there and let somebody else weigh in on it, but uh, um, I would hope that, and we know this has got a lot of cost and stuff on it too, but uh, I think this needs a lot more thought and conversation before it gets pushed forward and be could become reality. So thank you. Members, Senator Bolden. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Wickland, uh, for bringing this bill. Uh, and thank you to the testifiers for coming to share your stories. I think that is really important. As we have these discussions, I think it is really important to focus on Minnesotans and what they are experiencing and what they need. That is our job as I see it. Um, I had the uh, good fortune to um, attend a number of listening sessions over the interim around health care and hear many, many stories from Minnesotans about how our current uh, you know, system is failing people and harming people every day. One of the testifiers um, described the, our health care system as impossible. And I think that's so true for so many people. And so we have an opportunity here to expand care and coverage for more people. You know, our Minnesota Care program is a good program, as, as was mentioned. Uh, the benefit set is generous. Um, I talked to lots of folks who talk about it's the, it's the best plan they've ever been on. And we heard a, a testifier um, here today who was on it and got a raise, then wasn't able to, you know, uh, qualify for the program uh, and lost coverage. And so that happens to people. They have good coverage and then get a raise uh, and then don't. And so, you know, as we talk about costs, it is cost effective to be sure that people can have care. If people have primary care, if people have access to regular preventative care, that is cost effective. It is far uh, more cost effective to be sure people have that regular preventative care uh, than don't and, and having to wait until they just end up in an emergency room. 
Um, I appreciate Senator Upke's comments about rural Minnesota. I think that's really important. Uh, and one of the, the benefits about this, as we talk to farmers in rural areas, uh, they are having to right now purchase on the, on the private market and are paying outrageous costs for a, a plan that doesn't actually cover anything. <laughs> they pay the premium, but then there's deductibles and co-pays and all these other costs that it, it really it doesn't benefit them. They are just paying, uh, you know, paying a lot for not actual care, or they decide, you know, I can't afford that, so I'm just going to cross my fingers and hope for the best and just hope that we don't get sick. Um, I remember in one of those listening sessions talking to um, a couple uh, farmers who did just that. They crossed their fingers and hoped nothing would happen, and then the husband got cancer, and that their life took a turn uh, with you know very difficult decisions and treatment and extremely high costs and debt that that resulted from that. And so, you know, again, we have an opportunity here. We have an opportunity to, to provide more care to more people and expanding Minnesota Care, a program that works well and provides good coverage is exactly the thing that we should be doing. There's lots of other things that we should be doing as well. This isn't the end all be all, the, the end of the things we should do to, to transform our healthcare system, but it is absolutely the next step that we should take to get more care to more people. So thank you for bringing this bill. Thank you, Senator Bolden, Senator Liskey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, Chair Wickland. Um, I want to start with the positive and we'll work our way through it. Uh, I, I appreciate that you're trying to find a solution. Um, I think our healthcare system, as we've all kind of come to the conclusion, is, is needing help. Uh, there's a lot of issues from the provider side, from the patient side, from the insurance side. So we'll start with that as a discussion because I think this is an attempt to find a solution. Um, I'm not sure if I agree with the solution at the moment, but at least we know that there's, there's work being done towards that solution. Um, and so I'm going to start with a, an easy question first. Um, I noticed in the amendment that on line 1.23 on the amendment it says under the age of 21 uh, for children. Um, is that in line with the Affordable Care Act or not? I, from what I understood, 26 is the, is the number that we're supposed to follow, but I could be wrong. Senator Wicklin. Uh, Madam, Madam Chair, um, I don't know if Senate Council could address where that, that um, change in the bill or what it affects because I know there's a reference to children and under the age of 21 um, but that I think relates to uh, Minnesota care coverage but go ahead thank you madam chair uh, Senator Liskey uh, this uh, particular language request was a request of the department um, under the public option, there would be no cost sharing exemptions for any specialized groups of individuals. And so that language under age of 21 was a reference to current language in statute uh, for Minnesota care that does exempt that age category for Minnesota care. And so this new language clarifies that that does not exist. And that was a department request. Senator Liskey. Thank you, Madam Chair. I uh, appreciate the explanation. I just wanted to make sure that we were following the, the, the way things are supposed to be. So I was just curious about that. Um, and then, uh, Chair Wickland, I do have a question about, um, is there anything in this bill that would basically say that the big employers, um, companies like in my district, I have Post, I have Flint Hills, I have different, different big companies that obviously offer um, health insurance through their commercial products. Is there anything saying that they could remove that and then send all of their employees to this public option? Uh, Madam Chair, the, this bill does not address that. I'm not sure what whether we could address um, large employer coverage at the state level in that way. I don't think I think that would be covered by, by federal um, regulations. So I don't I don't think we could. That would be covered by federal regulation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so my concern would be that these businesses, um, if they aren't covered by the federal, let's just say that they are smaller or mid-sized uh, businesses that are currently offering health insurance, choose not to offer health insurance to their employees and tell them to go search out this public option. Um, in theory, all of their employees would now end up in this public option as well. And, and my concern is that that might overload the the original plan on fixing it, and we may see a much larger bill than we thought we would be seeing um, in, the, in the near future. So that's just one of my many concerns on this bill, just because I can see that happening. Um, it's, it's something that we don't think would happen, but it, it might, and so that's, and that's something that I'd be worried about. 
Madam Senator, Chair, I guess I, I would just make a comment that we did put in place, um, there are caps um, so that enrollment, if, if, there, if a person was had under 400% uh, federal poverty line income, those below that would be able to enroll, but then above that, um, there would be a, a, a transition area where the number could be capped. And so those uh, people above that, you know, it might, it would limit the number that would be able to enroll the first year and second year, and then we would phase that out. And also how wonderful for that business owner not having to cover those costs anymore, right? Senator Liskey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I guess I guess that's my concern is that yes, we have a we have a good lean into it. You know, you're gonna you're gonna have two years where that's an you know a solution, but uh, I do worry about future uh, issues. And and I agree, maybe it's good for the business owner, but it might not be great for the employee or for the providers. Um, me personally, as a provider, Medicare covers about 80% of the cost of of an uh, an exam or an adjustment. Well, actually, they don't cover exams for chiropractic, but for an adjustment they cover 80% of the cost. The patient's private insurance then covers the other 20%. If we use this bill right now, I'd be getting paid 80% of the coverage um, and it wouldn't qualify for that other 20% that another insurance company would be liable for. Um, so generally Medicare follow, falls in the bottom third of payers um, and that's something that I do have as a concern. So thank you. Other questions? Seeing none, um, I just, uh, Someone said earlier, um, I'll stay calm today, what, what problem are we trying to solve? So I just wanted to bring that to the front because I think we lost sight of that. Um, we are trying to solve the problem of people not having access to affordable insurance. We are having, uh, we're solving the problem of people having insurance that they cannot use. And of course, we're trying to solve the problem of poor healthcare outcomes in America, secondary to lack of access to health insurance. I don't quite understand how providing care to another 100,000 people is going to crumble our healthcare system. I don't think that's gonna be the last straw. Um, but I did hear, and you know, every time we say, let's change the healthcare system, the sky is gonna fall. That's the immediate reaction from everybody. Um, and I, I didn't hear how, um, just theoretical scenarios of, of how it might happen. And someone said, well, we're gonna increase the subsidization of state plans, but in the last eight years, we spent $1.6 billion subsidizing plans on the private market. So it's okay for us to subsidize those plans, but not the state plans, which I find to be an interesting double standard. Um, and then Senator Wicklin talked about the reimbursement issue. We understand that medicine and healthcare does not occur in a vacuum. And so we are dealing with that. And also I'll, I'll mention that reimbursement rates don't matter when people don't use their healthcare. Um, so anytime that we can make healthcare more accessible by affor uh, offering more affordable premiums, significantly less cost sharing, which is a barrier to use of insurance and healthcare accessibility, and more complete coverage, we should do that. And that's what this bill does. So thank you, Senator Wicklin. Any closing thoughts? Uh, no, Madam Chair, that was uh, very well put. Um, I think I would just say that this is a proposal, this is a bill that would um, address access and affordability. And I think that when we talk about benefit sets being generous, um, I think that, I don't know if that's really the right word because we want people to be able to use the care they need um, to prevent chronic conditions from being um, extra costly, uh, to prevent them in the first place, to prevent um, other healthcare situations that we know are preventable. So I think that trying to address that um, through this public option is one way that we can um, show that uh, we do care about Minnesotans' health and we want to make take steps to, to move um, forward in addressing these concerns. Thank you, Senator. Would you like to make a motion? Uh, my motion would be that Senate File 4778, as amended, would be recommended to pass and referred to... Commerce. Commerce. That is the motion on the table. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? No. The motion passes, and we are adjourned. Mm -hmm.